Thank you. Good. Uh, thanks yeah. a lot, Jay. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pleasure to present our model here about the, the limits of control for COVID-19 outbreaks. And as I said, um, COVID has now pestered us for, for more than two years, and we all hope that it's uh, soon over. Mm -hmm. And some of the predictions that we have made, I mean, also had their best time already some time ago. But some of the conclusions that we can draw from this model, I think, will also hold for later times and also potentially for other infectious diseases. And some of the aspects are, at least I think, uh, at least, uh, theoretically quite interesting. So the whole work uh, was a work of a group, as you can see, that was more or less uh, all the group that I had at that time. Um, and so everybody engaged into that kind of modeling at that point, including uh, the technician and everybody who could also somehow provide some material for this. That's why it's also so many authors here. And if you were to look at uh, the coding and uh, those things, I mean, uh, the data is here and uh, uh, the Python program is in this uh, repository. So the background, you know, already, of course, is uh, the spreading of COVID. And in, in Germany, we were first confronted with this uh, because there was some event um, in a place called Gangelt, Gangelt uh, Langenbroich, where people had some kind of uh, festivity, which was called Kappensitzung, so some kind of uh, in, in early or late February. Um, and this kind of uh, bigger party, uh, one infected couple uh, visited this, and from that party there was a fast spreading observed. But at that point, the local administration was very clever. They immediately uh, made some quarantine, uh, they forced people to cancel events, and they also informed the population um, very comprehensively. <clears throat> But uh, that didn't help so much, or it, it helped, of course, but still there were fatalities. And as you can see here from this graph, um, the positive tests and also, I mean, the people who had been cured went up very quickly, um, even some death cases. And that was here, even the year was not given. So this place was very good in also informing people about what's going on. That's why it was good as a first step to, to model things. Even one year later, they still reported uh, the infected and the cured people. Um, so what one could have done, and as also has been done in your group, one could have done um, an ODE model to somehow understand the dynamics of the infections and how that's going on. And uh, what has been discussed at that point is, of course, this kind of SIR model where S is a susceptible, I is an infected, and R is a person who has recovered, and then try to understand the dynamics. And since at that point, it was already uh, somehow understood that not every infected person is also diagnosed. This uh, scheme had been extended a little bit to include diagnosed people, and only diagnosed people, of course, can come in the hospital, and in the worst case, in the ICU. And we also know people can die from that. So that was a scheme we were first thinking about uh, to include and that we also used later. And here we first uh, uh, used it uh, for an ODE model. And uh, what one can see is, of course, that the infection here also in red would go up very quickly. A lot of people would recover relatively soon. Uh, people go to the hospital or get diagnosed, go to the hospital here, the brown one or even into the ICU. And what one would see, this is here log scale. So Germany has something like 80 something million people, so almost almost 10 to the power of eight. Uh, so what one would see is that the capacity of the ICUs and the hospitals uh, would very soon be um, broken. But that, I mean, of course, it was very clear it was going close to the capacity of the hospitals, but it was never ever really over challenged. The oh, point sorry. is also, of course, um, can I can I ask something? Of course, please. Yeah. Uh, can you explain what is the meaning of uh, dashed line arrow and solid line in the SIR yeah, border yeah, figure? I, I can explain this. Uh, the the solid lines is what we really had in the model in in most of the investigations. Uh, 
the dash line we discussed uh, to consider. And later we also consider this, uh, I mean, that uh, recovered when we back to susceptible, but let's say in the original versions, uh, we didn't consider them, but we considered that they could put them into the model, especially also that people could die <clears throat> without being diagnosed. But of course, yeah, we don't have any numbers for this. Oh, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you for the question. Good, and one thing was of course clear from, from this model, a lot of details that have been very quickly recognized to be relevant could not be included. I mean, one is for example, what really the specific human human interactions would be, what the different age groups, for example, for example could contribute. Would it make sense to close uh, kindergartens or schools or how to protect the elderly and so on. There was a lot of specific questions that one would like to answer, which we could not answer with an agent-based model. And the, uh, the, which we could not answer with an ODE model. And that's why we decided uh, to create this kind of agent-based model. And of course, if you want to speak about agent-based model, we should just uh, define what an agent-based model is. And of course, an agent-based model needs an agent, is an, some kind of autonomous entity. Uh, one can think about a, a lot of things. I mean, the easiest thing that people often have in mind is just an ant or some kind of insect that can run around and do things. And this agent has a number of properties uh, that one want to define. For example, age, that can be also strengths or whatever it would be. It has some rules what it does and it can move in an environment. And it, if it moves in an environment, of course, a model also needs an environment. The environment also has some properties. For example, it can provide the food to the agents. It can also be changed. For example, if the agents do something in this. And then of course, last not least, this agent can interact with other agents and it can be agents of the same type or it can also be agents of different types. Yeah, and then one, one uses this kind of model to, to simulate the behavior of the system that one wants to study the interactions between the agents, the interactions of the agents with the environment, potential pattern that can arise from this kind of behavior, the influence of the rules that one has chosen here, for example, or the property of the environment. One can ask what would be the effect of some perturbation from the outside that one would do to this uh, case. And then of course, with above of that, one, one might also ask, is there something more that one can see that one cannot immediately, um, let's say, deduce from the agent itself. So some collective behavior on that system or emergence or some properties that are not explainable just from one uh, agent alone. And here in our model, of course, given the problem that we have, the agents, of course, represent human individuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in these processes that we have in the infection. Good, so what's now our model that has been called GERDA as an abbreviation. <clears throat> and the first thing is because we wanted to, let's say, be as close as possible to the reality. We looked into the demographics in Germany and looked into the data from the census just to know not only what the age distribution and the distribution of sexes would be mm. in in Germany, but also how do people live actually? So do they live as a family with kids? Do they live just as couples, grandma with, uh, with a child, single partners, singles, or let's say mixed versions of how people live together? <clears throat> and we made a statistics out of that. And then of course, sampled from this distribution that we have. And that gives of course, age distributions here from zero to 90, and it gives also distributions of households. So single people, two people living in a household or households with uh, three to six people. And as you see, here's already some comparison between what we have put in from the census and something that then comes out of the simulation, which in this case is almost the same, not perfect, but I mean, roughly it's a sample. Okay, and then, which is certainly special compared to other models that we have seen, we gave the agents routines. So we said, I mean, everybody has to do something during the day. 
So in the night, the people are mostly at home, which is here the green part. Then workers have to go during the day here, you know, as is hours in the day from midnight to next midnight. Workers have to go to their workplace. In the afternoon, they might go to some public place like a shop or whatever, a restaurant. Healthcare workers have to go to the hospital. Students, of course, go to school. Also pensioners move somewhere and meet other people. And if people, of course, can move, we also need an area where they can move, so the environment in which they live. And that is here in this case, in this place that we have, Gangelt, really the map of Gangelt. We have taken these maps from the sources called OpenStreetMap, so it's really mm -hmm. also open, one can use the data. It's also a community effort where people annotate their local areas. And then we have taken exactly that map and looked where is different houses, where is different workplaces, where is shopping centers, and how can people get to each other? I mean, meet normally. I mean, neighbors would meet more often, or people would meet go more frequently to the shopping center next to their house instead of some somewhere else. And that we also use in the model. So when people then move between different places here. The agents, of course, they can go there in a pace of, I mean, of every hour, they can change the location, given their daily routines, and mm. then they can meet in these different locations. And if mm -hmm. somebody is infected, then this person has some certain probability to infect mm -hmm. the other ones. Good, and this is so called the input. And then, of course, we need one more thing if it's about, I mean, up to now, it was just people meeting and having contacts. And uh, now we also want to get the transmission or the, the state changes with respect to the disease. We take the same scheme as before. And then we have now tried to define the probabilities of transition from one state to the other one per hour. So in every hour, people can meet in different locations. And in every hour, they have a chance to change their state with a certain probability to the next potential state. And that we calculated, and I show you the data on the next slide. The idea is, of course, if you are in one state, for example, if you are infected like here, then you would have a probability that is more or less, let's say, taken from a Gauss distribution roughly to go from infected to infected and diagnosed. So here's some kind of mean and some Gauss distribution, which is of course truncated here. Going to recover, there's also a probability like this light gray one here, also with some mean here, and then it ends at about 50 days. And the same if you are already diagnosed, you have a probability to go to the hospital, this gray, light gray or medium gray, you have a probability to be recovered, this light gray and the probability to die here indicated by the darker gray version, probability per hour. And uh, we have taken this, this is unfortunately all in German, because it's from the Robert Koch Institute and they gave daily reports about all the data that they had and we used their data then to calculate for the different age groups all the cumulative probabilities to go from infected to diagnosed, from infected to recovered, from diagnosed to hospital and so on per age group here. And this was uh, the mean day here after four days, for example, for this distribution and the maximum day that we could have. So that's the input. <clears throat> this is data that we have, let's say, assumed as given um, because it came from these reports. At the end in our model, we have just two parameters left that one can tune. Uh, to play around and let's say um, investigate the behavior, the dynamics of the model that is the so-called interactivity. So how likely it is that I interact with one of the partners whom I meet in one um, of the location. And of course, this interactivity can change when people behave differently. For example, wear a mask or uh, distance themselves. And then we have the infectivity. That means how likely it is if two people interact that they can, <clears throat> that they can um, transmit the virus. And of course, the probability of the transmission of the infection in total is in this product 
of the two of them. And this is parameters we, that we, of course, systematically also investigated what the impact would be. Um, let's look first of all to the interactivity between agents. So as, as I said already, the agents follow their schedule, they visit the different locations at each location, they can interact with somebody. And then if they interact, they can also with another probability um, transmit the infection. And so the, the probability of interaction is given by the size or the number of people who are or the individuals who are at the location. So we have our parameter mu divided by n minus one because interacting with yourself is, is not interesting. <clears throat> and of course, this can be, of course, this probability cannot be larger than one. That's why there's some rules here. And it can, of course, also be that you cannot realize all these probabilities. Yeah? So for example, if there's an interactivity of two and there's only one other person in the room, yeah, then uh, you cannot choose <laughs> the different uh, things. The probability distribution or the frequency distribution that we then obtain when we now simulate the model with this uh, looks a little bit, let's say, unusual. Um, if we would have, uh, let's say, a normal agent-based model or an agent-based model where we would not insist on people being in their locations and having their schedules, um, then of course what you would expect uh, as a distribution is something like a bell-shaped, essentially Gauss distribution more or less, um, where the mean is typically around mu equal, to, in this case, equal to two. What we get here is first of all, that the mean is a little bit lower. This is because not all of the interactions can be realized. And we also get these different peaks. And these peaks are due to the different groups in the uh, population mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. behave differently. So for example, the mm -hmm. kids contribute a lot to this high peak here because they can meet a lot of other kids. Pensioners contribute a lot to this very low peak here, the low number of interactions because they often really don't see so many other people. <clears throat> they also need people, but of course, less. Okay. And then of course, if we um, lower the value for the interactivity a little bit, then of course we get another distribution with lower number of interactions and still not completely symmetric uh, around the mean, but yeah. And then we can of course look at the interactions that we would obtain. Here it's sorted per age group. So we here we have the age groups from zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15, and so on up to 90. And here, of course, uh, the other interactor. And what we, of course, see, and that's a little bit reflected from here, is that the kids have a lot of interactions, especially in school. The people in the working age, of course, also have interactions, but less in the families here. And the pensioners have interactions mostly among themselves but of course also to some extent to a lower level here with all the other age groups. When we lower the interactivity, then it's suddenly so that people are more or less, I mean, whom they meet of, meet of course is those people in their household. They spend of course a lot of time in the households. And that's why we suddenly see that we have much more interactions here between people of same age or people uh, where they have the ages of the kids or, or the parents. Yeah? So, parents and their kids meets a lot in one household and in the household itself. Oh, this, hop on. No. No. Uh oh. Ah. <laughs> okay, yeah. that, that was the interaction. Now, of course, we can go just, just to a simulation here, just one, one of the first examples. So if we would now have one infection brought into our population, I mean, they reconstructed the population and in this place gangled, they have a bit more than 10,000 uh, inhabitants. And so that means that also our population, our artificial population had a bit more than 10,000 uh, inhabitants. And if you bring in one or just a few infections and of course the infections go up, the susceptible go down, uh, most people recover after some time and we will also have a certain death rate you see the you might see at least the black line is slightly above the red line here so there is uh, cases of that and we can of course also follow who is um, 
infected or who was infected, who is diagnosed or who was diagnosed, who is uh, in the hospital and in the ICU over the time that one can follow, of course. And here we now see this whole infection process projected really on the place of Gangel, just to see. I mean, here you see it's bit the center of the city. Here's some other centers and in between. It's a little bit lower density where people live. Here you see, I mean, mm. the hours, uh, how the infection density changes. And mm. this rhythm that you see is essentially the days so that people during working days come together at places where people work, yeah, factories, shops, and so on. And then in the night, of course, they go back to the small local places where they have all the houses. Oh. Yeah. And now it's slowly, I mean, this wave is over. Mm -hmm. That is now all assuming that nobody would have done anything, yeah? that the infection comes in and people just continue their normal life without taking any kind of care. And of course, we all know that that didn't happen. But uh, as I mentioned already in the beginning, there was a quarantine and there was, I mean, closing uh, events and so on. And what we now did, as I said, we also tested all the different parameters that we had. And of course, if we sorry. test the... Yeah. Sorry, uh, can you... Uh, I'm sorry, can you explain once again uh, M and H in the map? Sorry, sorry, I'm trying to in, go back. Yeah. In this map? Yeah, um, in this map, yeah, M and H. M, there are M, some is, M is a mark. M is a mock because that specific uh, uh, community, they don't have an own mock. That's why we have put an artificial mock into the map and H is the hospital. Ah, okay, I see. Ah, thank they, you. They, don't, they don't have a hospital, but of course we have to consider that um, people have to go into the hospital. Hmm? Sorry for that, I, I forgot to explain. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Good. As I said, we tried to test. We tried to test the different parameters, and we see for the infectivity. Of course, that was the baseline infectivity that we have used, where we now simulate or made always hundred simulations or precisely ninety six simulations, just to see because it is a stochastic model. I mean, everything is um, how how they move and how they meet is stochastic. So, but when we see okay in this baseline scenario, the curves are relatively sharp. If we decrease the infectivity, we see at some point, I mean, first of all, the peak of the infection is uh, getting lower. And at some point it also gets a little bit smeared out. Yeah? So then of course, low numbers, it's uh, getting less sharp, the whole distribution. <clears throat> and uh, as it says here, all simulations are based on the same initialization of the work. Of course, we can always choose the, the population that we have, we could, choose this again and again, and we also did this uh, very often, but we can also take the same population, artificial population, and then do a lot of simulations with the same artificial population to be able to compare them. So if we would in, induce the, uh, reduce the infectivity, of course, we could slow down the spreading and also have lower infection numbers, of course. The next thing is, of course, what has happened is lockdowns. It happened in Korea, it happened in, in Germany, it happened, I think, in most of the countries that at some point, most of the public places had been closed, people stayed at home, um, doing home office and so on. And we just tested what would be the impact now, again, for this kind of baseline scenario with this uh, certain infectivity. When we close at different times, and what we see, of course, when we close very early after 100 hours, so about four days, then there's, just an infection happened, but it's very small. If we close two, two days later, here yeah, and 50 hours, there might be a little bit of an infection. And then of course, when we come later, the wave is getting bigger and bigger. And at some point closing doesn't make any sense anymore because the wave will happen, whatever you do. I mean, so it doesn't make sense here to close, to close too late. But if we close early, it can be very effective. Another thing we tested is uh, the compliance of people. 
of course, when you when you have a lockdown, it can be that people cannot follow this uh, lockdown because, for example, the bus driver still has to go to work and drive his bus. His bus. But of course, at least in Germany, we also had the problem that a lot of people didn't agree with all these measures and <laughs> they decided for themselves, they simply don't want to follow. They don't want to wear masks, they don't want to stay at home, whatever. So, but let's say irrespective of what the reasoning for the individual people would be, we just checked what it would be. <clears throat> so here we had a lockdown at uh, 200, mi uh, 200 hours and look then what would be if you have a non-compliance of 5%, so 5% don't follow the rules, then we say, okay, that doesn't matter so much, the wave is very low, but okay. If we would have 10%, then we already see that's a little bit more of a wave. And the higher the non-compliance is, of course, the higher the wave is, and 50% non-compliance means the wave is still a little bit lower than if we would have, let's say, nobody, being uh, under lockdown, but still there is then really a sizable kind of wave. And then we tested another scenario that is we have a lockdown, a relatively early lockdown, so lockdown at 200, but then of course one doesn't want to have the lockdown for all the time, so we have to open again. And then we tested what would be the influence of different reopening time. And here we saw phenomenon uh, that first surprised us a little bit, but then of course later we could explain it. And we see, okay, here, yeah, we, we open, we open very early, so that means the lockdown didn't have any effect. We open a bit later, see the wave is a little bit lower, and then at some point we see there's two different behaviors happening. Yeah, we have a first wave, and then suddenly we have a second wave, but less clear, and then we see still infected people down here. Of course, it's most clear here for the blue and the green line. There are some blue lines staying up. That means not so many people got infected mm -hmm. and other blue lines going down. <clears throat> so means there's a bifurcation yeah? or some, some bimodality itself. Means part of the population is doing one thing, part of the population is doing another thing. And we see that here uh, also for a few later reopening times that we still have this uh, bimodality here also, and then at certain point, when we reopen very late, there's again a very clear response. That means in these intermediate lockdown periods, we get bimodality in the response to, to this kind of measure. And that then actually, we started to look deeper into this or found this all in different cases. But before I come to that, here just a little overview of the things that we can now of course simulate uh, with our model. One thing is, as I have demonstrated, we can just simulate the state trajectories for the baseline scenario that we just have infection or for mm -hmm. say, different scenarios that we can think of. Another thing that I have not yet mentioned is that we can also simulate how this so-called R value behaves. The R value is uh, for many of the SRI model is some kind of input value. It actually tells us how many secondary effects, uh, infections you would have. Yeah, if so one person is infected, how many other person that uh, persons this person infects? And as I said, normally it's an input value, but in our model, as we have made it, it's an output. We can just count how many other people will be infected by one person who's infected. And what we can see is, first of all, that it is different for the different strains that we had. And what we also see is, um, that it changes over time. So it's not just a constant, but of course it will change in the beginning. The first people can of course infect a lot. And then later everybody else had been infected already. So you cannot infect so many other people anymore. Um, I mentioned already the lockdown compliance. Here I put instead this attack rate. So what is a per percentage of people who got infected? And as you see, it increases uh, with non-compliance. Here's a pattern similar uh, to what I've shown before with the interaction. So who's interacting with him? Here we now ask who is infecting whom? So who is the infector in the age group and who is the infected? And what we see here is uh, of course mm -hmm. also that there is a dominance of uh, people in the same household infecting each other 
and also between the parents and, and their children here in this uh, upper two or lower line. Of course, there's also other, I mean, people infecting each other, but this is somehow a bit dominant. And of course, we can create now networks out of that, uh, and I will come to that if time will still permit, that we can look at the networks and somehow also analyze them. And we can, of course, overlay this to the place and see what the infection density is. So the density is, of course, highest in this also um, area where you have the high, highest density of, of, of places, workplaces, and so on, and lower in the other places. But as I said, this shall also be about this uncertainty and the way how to control it. Mm -hmm. And what we can see, of course, is that we have the limits of the control of the outbreaks. First of all, one limit is that we never have all the information. Um, and that's probably now worse uh, than before. Of course, now we have seen more. But at least in Germany, it's so that people don't get tested anymore. Um, you often don't know when people are infected, or even if they are sick, they don't need to be at home anymore. And of course, also the infectivity is a parameter that we can try to deduce from the, from the data. But of course, it's not a given. But the other thing is, of course, and that's an is an uncertainty in the prediction of the effect of the effect of the vaccination or these non-pharmaceutical interventions mm -hmm. that lie in the system itself. And one thing I had shown you already was this lockdown time or the reopening time, and that was here. Here we have again, let's say, now summarized for a lot of, of simulation when we have an early lockdown down or a little bit later lockdown, then we have seen, okay, the total number of infections if the lockdown is very early is low. And then we have some kind of sigmoidal change more or less. The later the lockdown starts, the more infected people we get. For the reopening time, it's a little bit different. Now, when we have a very early reopening time, we see that we have a lot of infected people and that stays also like that. When we reopen, late, then we see, okay, we really we are really effective here. <clears throat> but here in between is an area where we cannot predict what will happen. Uh, so it's here it's clear what happens, and here it's clear what's happened, but in between it's unclear. You can have two different outcomes of the same measure. And that, of course, means it's also a problem for politicians yeah, who have to say, ah, when should I, let's say, uh, change the lockdown? When should I reopen again? You cannot predict in this in, in, in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one thing that what one of course can do also with our model now, since we have in the model, we have workers, we have people in the hospital, we have uh, people who are in, in public spaces, we have the kids in school. Of course, we could now link this also to some kind of economic model and just ask <clears throat> what would be the time of working hours that we have lost by doing a certain length of lockdown. Yeah, and one could also do other measures. We didn't go too much into that, but at least it would be a potential to do this with this kind of, of model. We then also <clears throat> looked um, more specifically on how that would look if we now would have here the first infection at day zero, the lockdown at day 18, and then a reopening at, at varying days here, for example, 39, 46, 59. Then we can also see, I mean, what the what the dynamics would be here of of that case, <clears throat> so that we have some infections really taking up again, other infections not taking up again, and then we also see this R value that we have that we can even calculate different R values for all these different. Um, cases uh, that we had to. In one case, the R value would really go down from something like four down to close to zero at least. And in other cases, the R value would take up. And I mean, that is even here. So if the reopening is still a little bit later, but of course it's becoming very noisy then at that point also. Another, let's say, way of, getting this uh, bimodality also I mean this unpredictability to some extent is uh, the dependency on the infectivity here in that case yeah what we now in the case before changed or varied was a lockdown and reopening times and here we now 
have no lockdown, but just our normal scenario and vary the infectivity. <clears throat> and what we see is also when the infect where is the mouse here? When the infectivity is relatively low and we vary this between low and very low values, you see also when the infectivity is very low, then we would get a almost zero attack rate because it would immediately vanish. Uh, but then we also get into an area again, very high infectivity. Of course, we would always get high rates, attack rates. And in between again is an area that we cannot really decide and not precisely predict specifically what will happen. Yeah, there's a bit of a transition, but here sometimes you see, okay, sometimes we have zero attack rate and sometimes we have higher attack rate. The same holds for the same values of infectivity where they are zero value. So, I mean, <clears throat> in fact, I mean, an average number of second cases after first infections we see here again is an area where it's unpredictable. So that means essentially it's also, I mean, we also play with low numbers yeah? and that's specifically an effect of the, of the fact that we have often low numbers and of course low infectivity leads to low numbers and then it's hard to predict what the outcome would be of, of, a, of, a, of some kind of measure. Um, then we also asked, of course, uh, is that real, this kind of bimodality? Can we really see that also in, in real cases? And of course, in reality, it's always very complicated to play through those things. Yeah, you cannot take just uh, one community and let them go through the same kind of infection twice. Uh, which would of course be the perfect um, mm. experiment. But what we then found was data from different uh, districts in Germany who, this was in 2021, in the summer period here, who entered with the same values, roughly the same values, uh, this called of seven day incidents, which had been reported at that time a lot. <clears throat> and they still went through the summer in different modes. Yeah, here in this course, case, Ilmkreis, went through with very low in infection rates, Dilling and Anadonau, they had a lot of infection. And here the same, uh, these two different crises, one, one had low infections, the other one also had a second wave. And here one would even know, I mean, how people had been vaccinated at that point uh, in these two different places um, here in, in Ilmkreis. Lots of people had gotten the first dose of vaccination, many even already the second dose. In this place, there were even more people vaccinated. Yeah, many of them had their first dose, and some already the second dose, so more than in this. So it's there is randomness. Yeah, there is this stochasticity that sometimes lead to a, that the infection dies out, and sometimes it comes comes up again. Since vaccination have been uh, mentioned, we also mm -hmm. simulated vaccination. Actually, we did this already before the vaccinations were out. We were asking ourselves what would be the best way to start with the whole thing. Um, but <clears throat> now, of course, we know what has happened. Um, at least in Germany, it was so that people had been vaccinated according to their age. Yeah, so that is um, the oldest people got vaccinated first, and then the younger, I mean, <laughs> you continue with the younger ones. And that would in this curve be this orange, uh, uh, in this graph be the orange curve here, where we have the fraction of vaccinated and um, the outbreak frequency, I mean, how many outbreaks we could really have. We could also, I mean, show the infected people, but the outbreak frequency also somehow <clears throat> presents it. What we see when we vaccinate people according to age, then the outbreak frequency stays high for a long time time of, let's say, until a very high fraction of vaccinated people, you really have to come close to 100% to really get the likelihood of getting another outbreak very low. Alternatively, of course, you could vaccinate people just randomly like this red curve here. And you see, okay, this is also this kind of herd immunity threshold that is often predicted. Yeah, if you get like about 70% of people vaccinated, then you should have a stop of the transmission, at least that was discussed before one knew the, all the different, let's say, strains of the virus. So that would fit with some kind of random transmission, more or less. But then, of course, one can also vaccinate people in a different way. <clears throat> one way is, as somebody else suggested, this kind of forecasted, that one would just um, 
predict how they would be infected uh, from one model to so run the model once and then forecast uh, who would be infected first. That would be this strategy. And from our point of view, the most um, effective uh, strategy would be to vaccinate the most interactive people first. So, I mean, from our simulation, we can also see who has the most interactions in this uh, model. And then if we vaccinate those people first, you see that would be most effective and also um, decrease the frequency of outbreaks first. And we can also see this when we now look at the ratio of the infected, that would be very uh, effective. <clears throat> Interestingly, of course, if we look at the level of deaths, um, vaccinating the old people first is better. I mean, it's getting the deaths down much earlier than, the, than all of the other strategies, but it doesn't get it down at the end here. So we would still also, if a lot of, I mean, a high fraction of the population is vaccinated, we still have a quite high death rate I mean, in this model. And of course, we now can also look what the different strains, what kind of effect they would have of, on this behavior, or also the infectivity, if we would be able to weigh that. But that means also at least that neither the random strategy nor the strategy of vaccinating according to age is really optimal. And I think this would now also hold for other diseases. It's not only um, restricted to, 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 to go on. I also think here, yeah, I mean, other diseases that are transmittable via interactions, one should consider to um, vaccinate interactive, interactive people first. Okay, and now we also looked at the dynamics in specific communities. I mean, one thing is uh, being a bit more, let's say, mm -hmm. in Germany, whether we can present this with our model. <clears throat> and here we simulated again um, now, uh, I mean, we simulated more or less uh, the, the district that we have, but compared this uh, to data from Germany because that was also available. And what we see, we started here in, in January 21 um, with the conditions that we had there, precisely the data from, from that point of, uh, from that date. Then we would see, we would again run into this kind of bimodality that I mentioned already. So when we have like thousands of simulation a number of simulations would show a next wave and maybe even a next wave, but also some number of simulations show that the infection would die out from that. So if we would have been lucky, there would have been no further waves in 2021, but there had been waves and they had been reported. I mean, here both for this specific district where Gangelt is, Heinsberg, and then also for whole Germany and, and red. We got then also calculate the reproduction numbers, these are numbers, and, and they fit quite nice also with this, let's say, <clears throat> the specific noise. And also in the different periods here, they don't fit exactly. The assumptions that we have put in is just following what also happened, at least in Germany. We had these different waves at the beginning of the more, uh, still the more or less wild type of the, um, of the strain. Then we had the alpha strain that had more infectivity, and then we had the Delta strain even more. We did not yet include Omicron and other versions. And of course, we could also follow how many people had been vaccinated and also what the infectivity would be dependent on the ratio of the different strains equivalent in the, in the population. And we also looked then, of course, if we can simulate this, we can also simulate what would have happened if nobody would have vaccinated. And of course, infection rates would have been much, much higher. And or what would happen if uh, all the kind of non-pharmaceutical measures would have been lifted would also be higher, but not as bad as no vaccination. So vaccination was obviously very important compared also to the other measures. And then we simulated a lot of other places also just to see is what we get yet now only dependent on <clears throat> the specific little location that we looked at, this place Gangelt here. We also did other places here in Germany, one in the UK, one in Sweden, and also one in Israel. And one thing is actually not shown here, also one in Mexico. And I will show that in a second. Here we have that. <clears throat> so um, the interesting thing, let's say, between 
Germany and in comparison to both Israel and Tepoztlan is actually that we have, let's say, different demographics uh, in these different places and also different uh, structures, of course, of, of the cities. Uh, I mean, in, in Germany, we typically have a household site, oh, there is a dot missing of 1.9, so just, let's say, two. I mean, typically two people live in one household. As I mean, <clears throat> in Israel, it's uh, 3.2, and in Mexico, it's uh, 3.6, so larger household, and especially also typically, especially in Israel here, much more kids uh, in these families, and they have a different distribution of the building types here, so much more schools in Israel um, and also in, in Tepoztlan, it's different. And the consequences, of course, also that we see different pattern of, of spreading of the infection in these different places, which is here, I mean, shown as a simulation over time. You see here, it's much more dense in, in this place on the Tepoztlan. And this was a picture I showed you already here for the German little place, Gangelt where we, of course, see some focus of the infection transmission in the families and in the schools here. And in Israel, it's uh, much stronger. So there's really the school kids uh, transmit the infection a lot. And then it goes here to school. And here also in, in Tepotzlan, obviously, here we see also some strong, I mean, the 50-year-old <laughs> obviously also contribute a lot of to the transmission, but we see a, a stronger pronouncement of, of what, what happens here uh, between kids and between younger people. Good, and last not least, if, do I still have a few minutes or? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's okay, <clears throat> please take your time. Okay, um, of course, now that we have this uh, model, uh, of course, we can create networks, or I mean, the simulation by themselves create networks that we can analyze. And we can also see, let's say, each of this primary infection of the start of some kind of infection tree and that we can follow and yeah, now in the process of analyzing um, these kind of networks. That's not yet finished as such here. One can see one of these uh, infection trees a little bit more. So this would be the seed infection, just one person, one individual who has been infected and then infects other people. And the gray ones are those who get infected and then also transmit further. And the red ones are all the final nodes, yeah, who, who are not, I mean, who get infected but not transmit the infection any further. <clears throat> and of course, we can simulate this taking every individual in the place as the seed infection and then see would there be different paths, would there be paths uh, that uh, appear with higher probability than other ones. What we see here is, a, let's say, an analysis of just one of these uh, simulations <clears throat> where we see the length of the infection layers, also how many people would be in one or agents in one of these infection layers. And we see that it centers around eight here. And then we can also look at the different, the distribution of people, how they contribute to this different infection layers. For example, here sorted according to their professions, yeah, the adult ones. Um, are these orange ones here, you see they contribute many more, I mean, more than, than their country, uh, I mean, than their percentage here uh, to these different infection layers only here, not to the very high or outer infection layers. Um, also the public workers contribute more, the pensioners contribute much less. Mm -hmm. So the pensioners are somehow underrepresented in these infection layers, except of the very last ones. So the pensioners are often really the last ones who get it. They are not the active spreaders typically, but they are often the recipients. <clears throat> we can also see how that goes through the different groups. I mean, here in that case, an adult was in infected first, and then the next infected was also an adult and uh, he or she then infected three other people, two adults and uh, a pensioner, and, and then it goes on. And of course, when we go here through the infection layers, we also see that it's getting later and later. Of course, the inner of the infection of this kind of uh, tree gets infected first and then, then we go out. And now we would also like to, let's say, go a step back 
forget a little bit about the infection, <clears throat> but just ask for the interaction networks that are coming out of the way how we have constructed our model and now look at the interactions over time, whether we can sort that. And the idea is now uh, to put this into a graph of this of these interactions. And here it's now a temporarily ordered graph where we have all the different agents and then we see who they contact, I mean, in the, in the next time step. And of course, if two agents contact, that's always symmetrically. So we always have two arrows here. And of course, every agent keeps contact with himself. And then from this, we will deduce what are most likely paths through such okay. a kind of community. Because that might also be interesting for other kinds of interpretations that are independent of the specific disease. And last not least, uh, here we find also some <clears throat> average path lengths in that specific community that we have and the probability with what they can be seen. And we see here typically path lengths are around four to five. And that's of course what we have. This is this kind of a small world phenomenon that we often see even in a population with about 10,000 paths are not so long from one to the other. And then we can of course ask how often do specific of these passes now occur uh, in this likely passes and how dependent are on the age of the uh, agents that are now contributing them or also, I mean, <clears throat> what is the type of the agent occurring in these passes that are taken very often on what we see both <clears throat> in the passes that come, let's say, less likely than uh, 30,000 times here. Yeah. I mean, after all the simulations are more likely, we see that the, the adult people play a strong role, of course, because they go to different places, they go to work, to public places, and of course, stay at home. Um, and the public workers, PWs, uh, the public workers here, and especially here in the very frequent passes, uh, they, they play a big role. So of course, the public workers, people in shops, restaurants, and so, of course, interact with a lot of different people and might also bridge then different paths of context. Okay, and with that, I'm more or less done. Just as a summary, of course, we have this kind of geo specially referenced and demographic agent based model that led to this kind of uh, mm -hmm. abbreviation. <clears throat> uh, we think we have some kind of relatively realistic patterns of this temporal and spatial spreading of the infection. We can model all kinds of different scenarios. And of course, we can do this network analysis that we now have um, to understand the interactions and the ways of uh, infection transmission better. And we can use this as a com computational laboratory to analyze this infection spreading. We hope that, of course, at least in Germany, it appears to be more or less done. People get used to it. But what we see is, of course, there is no model that fits all the different communities. Of course, the demographics and all, so the location, the geographics play a role. And it might be that different measures are better in different places. Of course, we wish all the best. And this is, of course, the people I have to thank. As I said, most of the group participated in that whole endeavor. And Björn is here, the first author. He's still working on this kind of network analysis now together with Hanno. Yeah. And with that, I would like to thank those people, of course, and of course, you all for your attention and for listening to me. Thanks mm -hmm. a lot. Ah, wow. Thanks so much. Oh, is it all your member? Some people have left by now. I mean, this, oh. was, this, this was a group when, when, when we started uh, this model. Some of them now mm -hmm. moved on to other places. Uh, mm -hmm. But I thought because these are most of the people contributing to that, I better put them on then in the current wow. version. Oh, a lot of work. Okay, so uh, okay, so thanks for the great talk. Uh, okay. Uh,